Hello friends. So oh, good evening. So today I'll be just giving you a brief overview on uh, subculture in ICU. Uh, so this is in context of uh, the journal that we presented, the the revived study uh, that is published in NEJM. So this is in the context of uh, the journal that's going to be discussed. Uh, so. So this journal actually debunks our whole understanding about the importance of stress ulcer prophylaxis. And we had de-emphasized on the role of uh, routine stress ulcer prophylaxis. So this particular study sort of debunks this. So it's important to understand the risk factors for stress ulcers in ICU and what is the evidence that has been prevailing. So just a brief overview over the next seven to eight minutes. So when we look at epidemiology of stress ulcers in ICU, so the commonest sites of stress ulcer is found to be in the fundus and the body of the stomach. But stress ulcers can occur even in esophagus and predominantly it will occur in the lower part of the esophagus. And it can happen in the body and the antrum and the duodenum. So these are the commoner sites. But the commonest has been found to be in the fundus or the body. And it can happen after that in the esophagus or in the duodenum and in the antrum. So these are the commonest sites of the stress ulcer. And if you look at epidemiologically, they are mainly divided into two categories, superficial stress ulcers and the deep stress ulcers. And it is seen that superficial stress ulcers tend to occur very early on in the course of ICU. So the, whatever is being talked is impertinent to ICU. But the deep ones tend to develop much later uh, in the course of ICU. So maybe after two, two weeks or two to three weeks, they develop. Uh, and these are more problematic, the deep ulcer. So what possibly we tend to see often is the superficial ulcers that we come across. And they're further divided into three sort of a clinical categories. So 15 to 50 percent are occult. So they are present, but not necessarily they may be manifesting with any of the symptomology. And overt is present in 1.5 to 8 percent where they do manifest with some sort of a coffee ground aspirate and GI bleed. But more clinically significant or which has a bearing on mortality is very less, only 1 to 3%. So 50% so of the cases, it may be occult and we may not necessarily have recognized them. So, But 50% of them are at a risk of developing these stress ulcers and we may not even know about it. So the clinically significant is what we sort of take note of or even the overt one. So it constitutes around... 1 to 3 percent and up to 8 percent. So this is the sort of epidemiological background. And the clinically significant ones which show up with bleed, they do have correlation with mortality and it can worsen their outcome. So this is what we are worried and this is what we tend to take note on and all our efforts are to prevent this clinically significant sort of a bleed. So this is an important thing for all our ICU trainees. When we talk about risk factors, why is it stress ulcer prophylaxis more pertinent or relevant to ICU? Because when we talk of the risk factors, there are three major risk factors which tend to occur in ICU. And, and this comes from the this NEJM article from Canada, uh, Deborah Cook study. So where they've shown that someone who is ventilated for more than 48 hours, so they are at a higher risk for stress ulcer. And the odds ratio for that is 15.6. So, which means the highest risk of stress ulcer prophylaxis stress ulcer happens in patients who are mechanically ventilated and the odds is very high and that comes from this uh, landmark article. And the second major risk factor is patients with thrombocytopenia or with existing coagulopathy of some sort. So, if INR is more than 1.5 or APTT more than two times normal. So, these are the three, if you look at all the risk factors, the next slide will show all the other factors, but the three most important, which are categorized as major risk factors in ICU, is what is someone ventilated more than 48 hours, thrombocytopenia, and some sort of a coagulopathy with INR more than 5 or APTT more than 2 times. And they, the odds for this is 4.3. So they're 4.3 times higher at a risk if someone in ICU having thrombocytopenia or coagulopathy. So this is these are the three risk factors we need to bear in mind in any patient. And possibly these are the patients who may benefit from. SUP, which is stress ulcer prophylaxis. And the study showed that the patients with thrombocytopenia or coagulopathy, they are at a risk of 3.7% versus 0.1% in someone who have had normal platelets or normal coagulation. So the other risk factors, just pictorially if you have to see, the sepsis is constitute one of the risk factors. 
and someone with major trauma or burns. So burns, especially if it's more than 35% burns, they are at a higher risk of uh, developing stress also. And anyone with the organ dysfunction, mainly with liver dysfunction or liver failure or acute kidney injury needing renal replacement therapy and patients with solid organ transplant and even ICU stay for more than one week, one few other risk factors. But the major are those three. These are all the other concomitant risk factors. And someone who's had upper GI bleed in last one year or who's had a history of uh, acid peptic disease or peptic ulcers, so all these constitute clearly evident sort of a risk factor for ACP. And someone who's on antiplatelets, especially cardiology patients who may be on antiplatelets with aspirin or glucocorticoids or NSAIDs. So many of our ICU patients are on glucocorticoids. NSIDs, of course, we don't use in ICU, but these are the typical risk factors that are referenced in the literature. And for ICU, sort of a, uh, from the ICU perspective, it is mainly the sepsis and liver dysfunction and acute kidney injury needing dialysis. These are the commoner ones we tend to see. And of course, patients who are on drugs like glucocorticoids or aspirin, they are all at a risk for stress uh, ulcer. And another important correlation of stress ulcer is the helicobacter pylori, H. pylori infection. So this comes from this important two studies. So one has come from French group. So in patients who had H. pylori, the risk of bleeding has been higher. So as you see, so 36% of H. pylori patients tend to have stress ulcers and bleed in ICU. And this was another study from Australia where 23% of patients with H. pylori bled as opposed to 13% who did not bled. So clearly there is a correlation with anyone who has H. pylori as a uh, as a dormant sort of an infection, they are at a much higher risk of having stress ulcers and bleed when they come to ICU. So this is the sort of uh, data that we have. So now the whole question is, how do we avoid uh, the stress ulcers in ICU and is enteral nutrition protective? So this is a big question that we have. So rather than using uh, stress ulcer prophylaxis, whether enteral nutrition alone can sort of prevent these stress ulcers so they, and, and I'm sure all our high school trainees know that there is a reasonably good body of evidence to say that early enteral nutrition prevents stress ulcers. And that's why our understanding until now has been we feed patients early. So not necessarily everyone would need stress ulcer prophylaxis. That has been our understanding. And there is no role for routine stress ulcer prophylaxis in ICU, especially in someone who has fed enterally early. And this has come from good sort of a uh, three trials. So this was again a good trial that came from Canadian group from Deborah Cook. So they did look at 1077 patients who were mechanically ventilated for more than 48 hours. And we know one of the major risk factors is someone who has been ventilated for more than 48 hours. The odds of them developing stress ulcer is up, up to 14 times. So here they showed very clearly when they compared the early enteral nutrition with late enteral nutrition, the risk of GI bleed was significantly less. As you see, the relative risk was 0.3 and confidence interval was statistically significant. So the risk of GI bleed was substantially lower in the group who were fed enterally, and that came from this landmark trial that was published in critical care medicine. And then there was this other trial that came from Germany uh, where they looked at burns patient. And we saw burns also are at a high risk of uh, stress ulcers. They looked at 527 patients and you could see the GI bleed was significantly less in early enteral nutrition. It was 3% as opposed to the group where they started late enteral nutrition, but they put them on SUP, stress ulcer prophylaxis with H2 blockers. Even there, the risk of GI bleed was higher. It was 8%. So feeding, early enteral feeding has an enormously protective role in preventing stress ulcers from these two studies. And then there was this um, good meta-analysis, and this is what we were sort of adopting in our current practice. So this came in 2018 in critical care, meta-analysis of seven studies, and they compared early enteral nutrition group with enteral nutrition with stress ulcer prophylaxis. So here, the second group did get enteral nutrition with stress ulcer, and they compared with early enteral nutrition. And they saw the GI bleed, mortality, and H. pylori, there was no difference between these two groups. But what they found is early enteral nutrition is good enough because in, if you give additionally stress ulcer prophylaxis, there was an increased risk of them developing nosocomial infections. So relative risk was 1.53. As you see, the confidence interval was significant. So this goes on to show, and this is what we were adopting until now, that there is no role for routine stress ulcer prophylaxis 
and in fact stress ulcer prophylaxis can lead to nosocomial infections and it increases the risk of nosocomial so this is what we understood and we were thought of uh, uh, thought of trying to avoid routine use of stress ulcer prophylaxis in i2 based on this meta analysis where it shows increase in the risk of nosocomial infections but all this possibly will be will have to rule relook in the light of this particular uh, revised trial that came uh, which shows some benefit to stress ulcer prophylaxis so that's about a brief context setting for the revised trial that will be discussed subsequently by our colleague uh, so i request all of you to attend our signature conference jig uh, that's going to happen from 18 to 20th october and request all our audience to submit their valuable work to journal of acute care I can visit my website. So thank you, thank you, one and all.